Hey guys, Lord Nairn White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in our series, Great Expectations. Without further ado, we're turning to Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter 26. It fell out, as Wemmick told me it would, that I had an early opportunity of comparing my guardian's establishment with that of his cashier and clerk. My guardian was in his room, washing his hands with his scented soap, when I went into the office from Walworth, and he, caught, and he called me to him, and gave me the invitation for myself and friends, which Wemmick had prepared me to receive. No ceremony, he stipulated, and no dinner dress, and say tomorrow. I asked him where we should come to, for I had no idea where he lived, and I believed it was in his general I believed it was in his general objection to make anything like an admission, that he replied, Come here, and I'll take you home with me. I embraced his opportunity of remarking that he washed his clients off as if he were a surgeon or a dentist. He had a closet in his room, fitted up for the purpose, which smelled of the scented soap like a perfumer's so shop. It had an unusually large jack towel on a roller inside the door, and he would, would wash his hands and wipe them dry, and dry them all over this towel whenever he came in from a police court or dismissed a client from his room. When I and my friends repaired to him at six o'clock next day, he seemed to have been engaged on a case of a darker complexion than usual, for we found him with his head butted into this closet not only washing his hands, but labbing his face and gargling his throat. And even when he had done all that, and had gone all round the jack town, he took out his pen knife and scraped the case out of his nails before he put his coat on. There were some people slinking about, as usual, when we passed out into the street, who were evidently anxious to speak with him. But there was something so conclusive in the halo of scented soap, which encircled his presence, that they gave it up for the day. As we walked along westward, he was recognized ever and again by some face in the crowd of the streets, and wherever that happened, he talked louder to me. But he never rec otherwise recognized anybody, or took to notice that anybody recognized him. He conducted us to Gerard Street, Soho, to a house on the south side of that street, rather a stately house of its kind, but dolefully in want of painting, and with dirt dirty windows. He took out his key and opened the door, and we all went into a stone hall bare and gloomy and little used, so up a dark brown staircase into a series of three dark brown rooms on the first floor. There were carved garlands on the paneled walls, as he stood among them giving us welcome. I know what kind of loops I thought they looked like. Dinner was laid in the best of these rooms. The second was his dressing room, the third his bedroom. He told us, that he held the whole house, but rarely used more of it than we saw. The table was comfortably laid, no silver in the service, of course, and at the side of his chair was a capacious dumb waiter with a variety of bottles and decanters on it, and four dishes of fruit for dessert. I noticed throughout that he kept everything under his own hand and distributed everything himself. There was a bookcase in, that ro in the room I saw in the backs of the books, that they were about evidence, criminal law, criminal biography, trials, acts of parliament, and such things. The furniture was all very solid and good, like his watch chain. It had an official look, however, and there was nothing merely ornamental to be seen. In a corner was a little table of papers with a shaded lamp, so that he seemed to bring the office home with, with him in that respect, too, and to wheel it out of an evening and fall to work. As he had scarcely seen my three companions until now, for he and I had walked together, he stood on the hearth rug after, the ringing the bell, after ringing the bell and took a searching look at them. To my surprise, he seemed at once to be principally, if not solely, interested in Drummle. Pip, said he, putting his large hand on my shoulder and moving me to the window. I don't know one from the other. Who's the spider? The spider, said I. The blotchy, sprawly, sulky fellow. That's Bentley Drummle, I replied. The one with the delicate face is Startop. Not making the least account of the one with the delicate face, he returned. Bentley Drummle is his name, is it? I like the look of that fellow. He immediately began to talk to Drummle, 
not at all deterred by his reply in a heavily reticent way, but apparently led on by it to screw discourse out of him. I was looking at the two, and when there came between me and them, the housekeeper with the first dish for the table. She was a woman of about forty, I suppose, but I may have thought that her young th- thought her younger than she was. Rather tall, of a little lithe, nimble figure, extremely pale, with large, faded eyes, and a quantity of streaming hair. I cannot say whether any diseased affection of the heart caused her lips to be parted, as if she were panting, and her face to bear a curious expression of suddenness and flutter. But I know that I had been to see Macbeth at the theatre a night or two before, and that her face looked to me as if it were all disturbed by fiery air, like the faces I had seen out of the witch's cauldron. She set the dish on, touched my guardian quietly on the arm with a finger to notify that dinner was ready, and vanished. We took our seats at the round table, and my guardian kept Drummle on one side of him, while Startop sat on the other. It was a noble dish of fish that the housekeeper had put on table, and we had a joint of equally choice mutton afterwards, and then an equally choice bird, sauces, wines, all the accessories we wanted, and all of the best, were given out by our host from his dumb waiter. And when they had made the circuit of the table, he had always he always put them back again. Similarly, he dealt us clean plates and knives and forks for each course, and dropped those just disused into the two bas- into two baskets on the ground by his chair. No other attendant than the housekeeper appeared. She sat on every dish, and I always saw in her face a face rising out of the cauldron. Years afterwards, I made a dreadful likeness of that woman by causing a face that had no other natural resemblance to it than derived from flowing hair, to pass behind a bowl of flaming spirits in a dark room, induced to take particular notice of the housekeeper both by her own striking appearance and by Wemmick's preparation. I observed that whenever she was in the room she kept her eyes attentively on my guardian, and that she would remove her hands from any dish she put before him, hesitatingly, as if she dreaded his calling her back and wanted him to speak when she was nigh, if he had anything to say. I fancied that I could detect in his manner a consciousness of this and a purpose of always holding her in suspense. Dinner went off gaily, and although my guardian seemed to follow rather than originate subjects, I know that he wrenched the weakest part of our dispositions out of us. For myself, I found that I was expressing my tendency to lavish expenditure, and to patronize Herbert, and to boast of my great prospects, before I quite knew that I had opened my lips. It was so with all of us, but no one more than Drummle, the development of whose inclination to gird in a grudging and suspicious way at the rest was screwed out of him before the fish was taken off. It was not then, but when we had got to the cheese, that our conversation turned up, turned upon our rowing feats, and that Drummle was rallied for coming up behind overnight in the slow amphibious way of his. Drummle, upon his, upon this, informed our host that he would much preferred our room to our company, and that as to skill he was more than our master, and that as to strength he could scatter us like chaff. By some invisible agency my guardian wound him up to pitch a little short of ferocity about this trifle, and he fell to bearing and spanning his arm to show how muscular it was, and we all fell to bearing and spanning our arms in a ridiculous manner. Now, the housekeeper was at that time clearing the table. My guardian, taking no heed of her, but with the side of his face turned from her, was leaning back in his chair, biting the side of his forefinger, and showing an interest in drama. That, to me, was quite inexplicable. Suddenly, he clapped his large hand on the housekeeper's like a trap, as she stretched it across the table. So, suddenly and smartly did he do this, that we all stopped in our foolish contention. If you talk of strength, said Mr. Jaggers, I'll show you a wrist. Molly, let them see your wrist. Her entrapped hand was on the table, but she had already put her other hand behind her waist. Master, she said, in a low voice, with her eyes attentively and entreatingly fixed upon him. Don't! I'll show you a wrist, repeated Mr. Jaggers, with an immovable determination to show it. Molly, let them see your wrist. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.